Thank you very much. Um, so let's 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 try and uh, get on with the second you know, in this series of lectures on um, decolonial thought. Um, so the subject for today is what I've called epistemic colonialism. Um, so in a moment we we'll make it clear what we mean by epistemic colonialism, but epistemology basically is a name for knowledge, you know. Um, so this is basically another way of talking about the coloniality of knowledge. <clears throat> now, one of the things that we established last week was the fact that even the so-called non-temporal truths of logic are actually temporal in the sense that they are understood by an agent or a mind that is determined by temporal dimensions. Meaning that what we consider to be the non-temporal truths of logic, of mathematics, of algebra, they cannot be non-temporal because they are understood by a mind that is determined by temporal dimensions. Because if we robbed you of your temporal, of your sense of time, you would not be able to make sense of those supposedly non-temporal truths. So they require you to first be infused with a certain sense you know, of time in order for you to be able to make sense of them. So they are not transhistorical. So if you take what we call, or what mathematicians and logicians want to suggest are these non-temporal truths, if you took them and possibly you were able to conduct an experiment and take them to pre-modern people, they would not be able to understand them. Because their sense of time is not the sense of time that is required in order to make sense of those non-temporal truths. And so there is nothing non-temporal about them. You know, uh, because as we did say last week, they, they require a mind that is fixed within a certain temporal dimension that has a certain understanding of time. So this is where we started from in order to establish the fact that there is nothing called universal knowledge. What makes knowledge universal is the fact that you've transformed people so that they have a certain mindset to understand this knowledge. And so what becomes universal is the modern rational person. And therefore, once you have this modern rational person you know, knowledge that is particular, supposedly particular, then becomes universal because you've transformed people all over the world to be the same, you know, to think alike. So what I want us to do today is to take further that logic. Now, we were able to establish the fact that virtually all modern disciplines, all disciplines of, of modern disciplinary, you know, knowledges, all the subjects that you study in the university today, whether it's mathematics, whether it's engineering, whether it's biology, you know, as you study it today, we were able to establish last week that they actually have a functional relationship with capitalism. They emerge out of the modern capitalist, you know, era, or they emerge as part, you know, of capitalist modernity, such that, for instance, economics as it is taught today would not make sense if the world was not capitalistic. The subject of economics would not stand, you know, if the world ceased to be capitalistic today. Just as it is that, you know, um, pharmacy as it is studied today would not make sense, you know, outside of modern capitalist medicine today. So virtually all the disciplines as you study them today we were able to establish last week have a certain functional relationship with capitalist modernity. They emerge as part of capitalist modernity. But we went further than that to say that if in Europe these knowledges emerge, you know, and have a certain functional relationship with capitalism, these disciplines come to the continent or they come to Africa via a different trajectory. And that trajectory is not the trajectory that they have in Europe, or the life, you know, or their birth in Europe is not the same as their birth in the continent. Because in the continent, these disciplines come to us via colonialism. Modern disciplines, as we study them today, they are first introduced into the continent 
via colonialism. So it is colonialism that midwives their birth within the continent. The institutions of higher learning you know, that we are in today are a function of colonialism, just as all the disciplines that are studied within these institutions. So the concern then today for us is if in Europe, modern disciplinary knowledges have a history that is locatable within Europe, if within Europe we can understand you know, the coming into existence of these disciplines in relationship to capitalism. In Africa, we can only understand the coming into existence of these disciplines in relation to colonialism. It can't be in relation to anything else. It is in relation to colonialism because it is colonialism that brings these disciplines here. So the expansion of Western you know, disciplinary knowledge into the continent basically comes via colonialism. Now, the point then that I want to establish today is the fact that if these modern disciplinary knowledges in Europe have a functional relationship with capitalism, in Africa, I want to demonstrate today, these disciplines have a functional relationship with colonialism. The point I want to establish today is very simple. We have established that in Europe, it is capitalism that midwives the birth of modern disciplines. And so these disciplines have a functional relationship with capitalism, as we've just proven. You know, outside of capitalism, all of these disciplines would not make sense. So I want to suggest to you this evening and prove to you that in Africa, these disciplines have a functional relationship with colonialism. They were meant to aid the process of colonialism. Whether it is biology, whether it is chemistry, whether it is any of these disciplines, you know, whether it is politics or sociology, they all have the same relationship with colonialism. They were meant to aid the process of colonialism, just as it is that in Europe, they were meant to aid the process of capitalism. Now, so if these disciplines abetted, you know, we want to establish that these disciplines abetted colonialism. The first point that I want, or the departure point that I want us to start at is, is a fairly established one, fairly incontrovertible. It is that colonialism could not sustain itself, or for its success, it had to depend on something more than just violence. Colonialism, in order to sustain itself and reproduce itself, had to depend on something more than just brute violence. Violence alone was not enough to sustain colonialism. There was something more that was required in order to sustain colonialism. In a language borrowed from Marxism, we would say that colonialism needed to produce the conditions of its reproduction in order to survive. Because if it did not reproduce the conditions of its reproduction, then at a point, you know, it would exhaust the capability of violence to subdue people. Now, what were these conditions of its reproduction? One you needed to inculcate in the minds of those that you colonized that it was in their interest to colonize them. Because if you did not have a class amongst those that you colonized that accepted or that acquiesced to the logic of colonialism, if everyone rejected the logic of colonialism, Violence alone would not have been enough to sustain it. So one of the things that colonialism had to do was to inculcate in the minds of those that it dominated an acceptance of colonialism as being in their interest. 
Now, this acceptance of colonialism as being in their you know, interest came in different forms. It did not need, require people to say, dominate us politically. You hear it today in different forms. People say, well, we are better off with you know, Western knowledge and Western you know, forms of life than we were previously. It's the same acquiescence. Uh, it amounts to the same thing when you say that, well, um, colonialism might have been bad, but we are better off you know, with, with you know, um, where we are than where we would have been you know, had it not been for colonialism. It is precisely the function of colonialism to make you think in that way that you are better off under colonialism than you would have been without colonialism. Mm -hmm. Now, modern disciplines had precisely this function to play. And I'm going to show you that it is not just the social sciences that needed to do this. It was medicine, it was, you know, all the disciplines across the spectrum. Because often the assumption is that it was just the modern, you know, socio, um, the modern social scientific disciplines that had that ideological function. Now, I want to suggest that that ideological function was ingrained in all the disciplines, even without, you know, trying to find a sophisticated argument. One of the things that early medicine, you know, concluded about us as African people was the fact that we did not have a sense of hygiene. And that was partly the reason why, you know, we were infested with diseases. Now, how could a people who lived for centuries without Western medicine all of a sudden wake up and not have a sense of hygiene? These were people who had not been decimated by disease for centuries, but all of a sudden, when Western medicine comes, it discovers that these are people who are on the verge of disappearing from the face of the earth because they lack the sense of hygiene. That discovery only comes at a moment when Western medicine comes into the continent. This is why then, you know, part of colonialism was part of the project of colonial domination were forced inoculations and forced you know, medicalization of life. Everywhere in the colonies, there was a project which compelled people to integrate themselves into the practices of Western medicine, where people preferred you know, other forms you know, of healing themselves Colonialism banished those forms of healing because it said there was something wrong. There were many reasons that were offered for why these other forms of healing were wrong, but only Western medicine was projected as the only form of acceptable form of maintaining your health. And so this is how we came to think of health, you know, in Western sense as only a bodily affliction. Because previously, we had known that health, you know, was not just a bodily affliction. It was also cultural health, but it was also spiritual health all at once. Because we knew that your bodily affliction in most instances was a manifestation of a disequilibrium in your relationship with the ancestral world. And so we knew, as just as we know today, that there are diseases that cannot be cured in the hospital. There are people who, for ages, go to the hospital and they are not cured because actually the source of their ailment is not, you know, curable through Western medicine. But what colonialism did was to banish those other forms, you know, of healing and imposed one, you know, form of health or one understanding or logic of what health means in medical terms. Now, why did it do this? We'll get to that point. <coughs> so what I do at this point want to emphasize is the fact that all modern disciplinary knowledges as they exist today, you know, came into the continent via colonialism, and as such, they have a functional relationship with colonialism. Their purpose was to aid the process of colonial domination. And as I've said, this includes all disciplines, you know, ranging from medicine to the social sciences. 
The reason why colonialism needed these disciplines to ensure that it could reproduce itself was because, as we've said again, it acknowledged the limitations of violence as the only form of domination. So violence as physical violence was not enough. You needed another kind of violence, you know, in order to sustain colonialism. You needed something we call epistemic violence to be able to sustain colonialism. So that's why, you know, we think of this, what we're doing today, or understanding today as epistemic colonialism. You needed to assault people physically and dominate them physically, but you also needed to assault them at the level of knowledge and dominate them at the level of knowledge in order for colonialism to be successful. And in order to do that, you needed the modern disciplines you know, um, of knowledge. And once you were able to dominate people epistemically, once you were able to dominate people cognitively, then, as we've said again, you had amongst those that were colonized champions of colonialism. So today you find you know, people who every time, you know, we speak about a decolonized form of knowledge tell us that, you know, um, they don't want that kind of knowledge. This is the knowledge they want that they've been taught, you know, um, and this is the knowledge they want maintained in these institutions. Now, this is precisely what epistemic colonialism does. It says to people that there can only be one form of knowledge and you must defend it, even though it's not yours. Even though you know, it came from elsewhere, then you must internalize it and accept it as yours and defend it amongst those who try to suggest that this form of knowledge you know, as perpetuates a certain relationship you know, between Africans and Europeans. So once you... So once you... Once you understand that you know, these forms of knowledge have a certain relationship with colonialism, we would understand you know, the colonial nature you know, of these disciplinary knowledges, or would understand the intricate or the dialectic between these knowledges and you know, colonialism, if we start from colonialism. What was the object of colonialism, and what were the technologies of colonialism? Because once we understand what colonialism was about, what was its objectives, what were its technologies, or how did it affect itself, we can then look at these disciplines and see whether they are in sync with the technologies of colonialism. So what were the assumptions, what were the motivations you know, of colonialism? Now I want to get to this point you know, via a slightly different route. Why is it that everywhere colonialism, when it established its first universities you know, in the continent, why did it give these universities colonial names? So colonialism everywhere it went, we said last week, you know, established universities. So you had, for instance, in Nigeria, or you had in all British colonies, the first universities were called either University College London, because they were affiliated to you know, University College London back in Britain, or in the French colonies, they were called the Sorbonne, because they were affiliated to Sorbonne you know, back in France. So why would you, when you go to establish institutions of knowledge production in other countries, why do you give these universities names that bear the names back in Europe? So you establish a university in Nigeria, why do you have to call it by a name you know, that suggests that the university is in London? Why do you call it University College London? Why didn't you call it a University College Nigeria? Or a University College um, you know, Lagos, wherever it was located? Why would you call it Sorbonne and not call it by the name you know, of that particular locality if it was a French colony? You know why? Because colonialism, one of the fundamental assumptions of colonialism is that this was a dark continent that was basically constituted by an unnamed mass. 
So the responsibility to name and order things belonged to the colonizers. And so the responsibility to give meaning to the landscape, you know, this was um, a violent landscape. Has anyone here read um, Heart of Darkness? Um, Joseph Conrad in Heart of Darkness talks about the violent, riotous landscape of the Congo. So even the landscape, you know, uh, itself, the trees, the rivers are considered to be primordial, you know, are considered to be barbaric, you know, in, in, in Heart of Darkness. So colonialism had a responsibility to impose some order in this disorder. Now this part of the project of imposing this order meant that you had, you had to name things that previously, supposedly, had no names. So you assumed that, you know, um, Congo's, you know, Stanleyville, these places had no names before. So it was the responsibility of the colonizers to give names to, you know, these places. So when they named these universities, you know, by the names coming from the metropolitan or from the colonial metropole, there was something else going on. As I've said, one of the things that was going on was that they were imposing order. You know, they were naming these unnamed mass that existed in the continent, this dark continent, you know, that couldn't be known. You know, it had to have names in order for it to be known. But there was something much more important, you know, than, than that. It is that <clears throat> once I have a right to name you, that allows me to impose a certain cognitive framework over you. So when your parents name you, they wish that you be a certain kind of a person. So the name they give to you is evocative of their aspirations that they impose to you, isn't it? So they hope that you would be this kind of a person. So what they do, they transfer unto you their own aspirations about you. So when I have a right to name you, it's not just an idle right, you know. It is that it enables me, you know, to exercise what is called cognitive domination over you. Because when you name things, you know, you also give them a history. So when you tell your personal biography, for instance, you would say, well, my parents had named me so-and-so because they tell me or I'm told that, you know, they had a hope that this is what I would become in life or this is what had happened in the family. And so in order to remember what had happened in the family, this is what, this is the name they gave to me. So what they've done, they've imposed a certain narrative over you. You now come to understand your personal being via their own aspirations and their own motivation. So when I name you, when I name the universities as University College London, it imposes a certain history. It means that knowledge, institutions of knowledge in the continent, when their history is written, is traceable to its <coughs> originary place of origin. So when I trace the history of knowledge and you know, knowledge production in the continent through these institutions, ultimately I'm led. My path of necessity must end back in Europe. Because it was University College London. So if I trace the history of these institutions and the knowledges they teach, obviously I'm led back to London. So the source of knowledge is back in Europe. So it means that it becomes inexplicable. Generations after colonialism, formal colonialism has ended. You are trapped into that history of tracing knowledge back to Europe. Simply by naming those particular universities. They have ensured that they've written for generations after, for centuries after, the history of knowledge that goes back to its originary place, which is Europe. There's no other way you can tell the narrative of knowledge outside of Europe. So it means that now, if you have to tell the history or trace the genealogy of modern disciplinary knowledges, you can't tell it otherwise. 
you know, of necessity, as I've said, that genealogy takes you back to Europe. Now, it means that in the psychology of the colonized, Europe has a guaranteed place. In the psychology or in the mind of the colonized, Europe has a guaranteed place, you know, eternally. Europe can think of itself without remembering you. <laughs> Europe can tell the history of its knowledge without remembering anything outside of Europe. It doesn't have, its history of knowledge does not extend anywhere. Not that it is true, not that their narrative of where knowledge begins is true, but it is because they have engaged in a retrospective telling of that history that says that at best you would end in Greece. So when you try to trace the history of these knowledges, at best it takes you to Greece, which remains Europe. It does not allow you to go beyond you know, Greece. Again, as I've said, this is not to say that this history is factually correct, but in any case, we now know that you know um, the world of facts, you know, and the world of representation uh, is the same. Um, as long as over time I've suggested to you that something is true and you've accepted that it is true, it is true. It doesn't have, you know, to have any other source of validation, you know. Um, you accept that Western medicine heals when you know very well that you know there are certain things that it can't heal you in. But you accept as true that it heals, isn't it? It is because you've been told and accepted that it heals and then it has become a fact. That's how you know truth emerges. But nonetheless, so my point here is the fact that the naming of these institutions to begin with was a deliberate project because I do not see how the task and the business of knowledge production would have been affected if these institutions, when they got to these particular places, they assumed names of those places. Why were they called? Why were they not called by the names of those particular places where they were located? So, I want to suggest to you that in all the history of knowledge, Europe must feature somewhere, you see. So when you study you know, medicine, when you study chemistry, at your subconscious, you must evoke Europe. You know, at, at, at your subconscious, you know, Europe comes, you know, into, or comes alive, because this is where, even without you so saying, this is where you know that this knowledge comes from. But because colonialism was not just, as we've said, you know, sustained through violence, it was also sustained through you know, knowledge so that it wins people over. So they believe that you know, uh, colonialism was good for them. Now, once you accept that the knowledge that Europe brought along via colonialism was good for you or was good you know, for the continent, one of the inevitable things that happens is that we are then locked in a certain relationality with this knowledge. As the colonized, we are locked in a certain relationality you know, with this knowledge. Because you are receiving this knowledge, so you are the receiving end, you know, of a knowledge that has been brought to you. So the person who brings the knowledge to you is the one who originates it and therefore has the autonomy of thought. For you, all you need to do is to receive the knowledge. So you are the receiving end. The originary task of thinking has been done for you. All that you have to do is to accept this knowledge and internalize it. Now, colonialism, as we've said, part of its assumption was the inequality between the European and the African. What makes colonialism possible, its condition of possibility, is the assumption by the European that, or by the Europeans that they were superior to us. And so, because they assumed themselves to be superior to us, they thought that it was legitimate and right for them to dominate us in order to civilize us. 
Now, part of the project to civilize us is to educate us, isn't it? <laughs> so part of the project, part of the project of colonialism is that Europeans have a God-given duty, according to them, to civilize us. Now, to civilize us was not just to teach us about a monotheistic God. To civilize us was to educate us also. So this knowledge that is given to us is part of the project to civilize us. It is part of the civilizing mission that Europe was engaged in. Now, obviously, there are unequal power relations between the civilizer and the one who needs civilization. The one who brings civilization obviously occupies a higher ground. You know, the one who brings the civilization, or rather who brings light, you know, in a dark part of the world, obviously must have a superior relationality to those who are still locked in darkness and who are still outside of history. Now, this is how Western knowledge presents itself to us. This is implicit in the structure of Western knowledge. It doesn't need to be pronounced. It is that this has come to you, it is in your interest, it is a gift to you by Europe. It is a gift to you by Europe in order that you may be like them, you may be civilized like them. Now if at this moment, you know, this is not obvious, I want to show you that this superiority, this asymmetrical relationality between Europe and us and Western knowledge and us is actually locatable you know, in, in, in the structure of Western knowledge itself. So it does not require people or Europeans to say to us that we are superior to you. By mere effect of studying these disciplinary knowledges, you accept the superiority of Europe. It's implicit in these disciplinary knowledges. How? Now, Western knowledge claims to be universal. We went through, we went through the claim to universality, um, how it may come about to be universal. Now, there is something, you know, in this structure of knowledge that is authoritarian, that, you know, maintains these asymmetrical power relations between the European and us. Now, what is universal? Now, the concept universal, you know, if you look at it closely, uni means one. Uni means one. It means that once you accept Western knowledge as indeed universal, you are saying that there is only one order of knowledge that is universal. Because the opposite of universality would be pluriversality. If there were multiple orders of knowledge, we would not end up with a universal order of knowledge. We would end up with a pluriversal order of knowledge. Now, ingrained in Western knowledge is a certain authoritarianism that says it's like a Christian God that says I'm the only God. You know, there's no other God that, you know, exists except me. You know, every other God that claims to exist is a fake God or is, you know, is, is whatever else, you know. Um, this is how Western knowledge functions. It is authoritarian. It claims that it, it is only Western knowledge that is universal. There cannot be any other form of knowledge. There can not be any other order. Roll call to the house. The, it means that there cannot be any other order of knowledge that is universal alongside Western knowledge. So what the European or what Europe does through this, this is a general call to all quiet members. Quiet practice is happening in the region at 9 p.m. now. Roll call to the house. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. All quiet members, quiet practice is happening now in the EJ Mall. Order, order. Okay, so, so far the point we want to establish is that ingrained 
implicit in Western disciplinary knowledge is, is the superiority of you know, the European and Europe and you know, of this order of knowledge, such that when we study this knowledge implicitly, we accept the superiority of Europe. Now, as I've said, I want to get to a point where this becomes acceptable to you by showing you how dictatorial or how authoritarian Western knowledge or the Western order of knowledge is. This Western order of knowledge, as I've said, claims for itself a universality, meaning that it is true across time and space. But once it does that, it not only claims you know, its validity across time and space, it then says that it can only be the only form of knowledge that is universal. It is the only form of knowledge that is true across time and space because it says that it is the only universal form of knowledge. If this is not enough to prove the authoritarian character, the superiority complex of this knowledge, you see it in how this knowledge then, when it goes wherever, it claims that whatever else claims to be knowledge must pass a certain standard, and that standard comes from it. And so Europe and Western knowledge says that because I'm universal, I'm also the standard of what knowledge is. Whatever else has not passed my standard of validity, of verification, cannot be knowledge. And so when we try, or those who try to then offer alternative forms of knowledge, you then again are faced with people who've internalized Western knowledge, who become then gatekeepers and say, but what you say is knowledge does not constitute knowledge. Now what they are doing, they are speaking for the superiority of the European and Europe and its order of knowledge. Because as we've said, this European order of knowledge does not just claim universality for itself, it goes further to say that any other thing that has an aspiration to become knowledge has to find validation in me. I have to offer that, you know, I have to extend that authority to whatever else wants to claim, you know, as knowledge. So the standard, the norms of knowledge then come from this Western order of knowledge. So when you've studied chemistry, physics, and all these disciplines, anyone else who tries to offer you what you, know, you think is related to your field, you say, no, that does not constitute knowledge because it does not pass the test of scientific objectivity and other norms of scientific validation. And so by what right does Western knowledge have this claim to supplying all of the world the norms of what constitutes knowledge. It is part of the colonial project that says that Europe has a God-given duty to civilize the rest of the world. So this is how Western knowledge also relates to other knowledges that it encounters anywhere else. It civilizes them, it sanitizes them, whatever it can take, it integrates you know, into itself. It picks whatever it wants to pick or whatever has passed the standard of scientific validation as it offers it. Whatever else fails that test of scientific validation then falls outside of knowledge. It's the same thing that the European does, isn't it, when it colonizes. It says your forms of life, you know, are not decent human forms of life, but we can retain this aspect of it, you know, um, would accept this. The rest you have to leave behind. So your religions you have to leave behind, your cultures you have to leave behind because they do not constitute a decent form of being human. It's the same thing that Western knowledge does. So here you see a parallel between the norms and assumptions of colonialism and the norms and assumptions of Western knowledge. The will to dominate in colonialism is the same will to dominate that you find in Western knowledge. The practices are the same between colonialism as a political project and colonialism as an epistemic project. So as I've said, Western knowledge takes itself to be the norm. You know, it says that it is the only form of knowledge that exists. 
it is the only form of knowledge that supplies the standard for the rest of the world as to what constitutes knowledge. Now let me try and exemplify this with something very related to the point. You know, there is a close relationship between the colonial project and a discipline earlier known as cartography. Cartography is basically map making. This is what geography would later become. You know, um, geography evolved from being, you know, cartography. It was concerned at its early stages basically with map making. Now, in its early forms, cartography was basically assumed, the assumption in cartography was that you could delimit the space, you know, in, 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 as it exists in the empirical world and represent it mimetically in a map. So you could take the rivers, you know, the mountains and everything and represent them in a map. So the assumption was that you could, you know, in a mimetic form, represent the empirical world in a map. Now geography was crucial to the colonial project because Europe needed first to have a sense, a geographical sense of these non-Western lands. Otherwise, without the knowledge of geography of the world, it would not have known where it was expanding to. So cartography was the first, well, was amongst the very first things that European colonizers had to do. They had to draw maps of the world in order that they would know where they were going to. But it was not that they needed to know where they were going to. These maps were also necessary for something else. It is that once you drew the map of South Africa, you know, which is going to be your future colony, which you want to dominate, it also needed to be knowable. South Africa needed to be knowable to you. Because if you drew a map of South Africa and it retained its original you know, names, then it would not be knowable to the Europeans. So part of you know, cartography was to wipe the existing names of those places and replace them with European names, such that you know, those places, those geographies, would cease to astound the Western imagination when they get there. So basically, you needed to make the land ready for you know, a takeover you know, when you get there. You needed to know it first cognitively in order to be able to dominate it. Now, you know, maps are drawn using an implement or an equipment called a Mercuta projector. You basically plant the Mercuta projector and you know, it gives you the sense of, 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 of you know, um, the map. For a long time, there were multiple maps of the world. You know only one map of the world. So when you study geography you know, anywhere, you know one map of the world. Chinese do not draw the map of the world the same way as you study, you know, the map of the world today. You know why? Because if you take the Mercuta projector, if you project, the geography from which you are projecting appears magnified. It appears larger than it is. So if you plant the Mercuta projector from here, this part of the world, because of its close proximity to the equipment, appears larger. The further the you know, geography is, the smaller it appears. Now, if you look at the geographical size of Europe today, it is not a myth that it is equal the size of Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo. Continental Europe is the size of Congo. But when you look at the map, it appears much larger than that. Now, the reason for that was that maps or the world map is drawn from Europe. And this is the knowledge of the world that you have that you live with. So Chinese refuse to accept this and they draw the world map differently, such that if you go to China and look at the world map from China, China appears much larger than it is. <laughs> <laughs> Not 
that it appears much larger than it is. It appears much larger than it is in the world map that you use from this part of the world that is drawn from Europe. Now, part of, of, of geography was to ensure that you delimited the knowledge of the world in such a way that it left Europe in a privileged position. It left the West, you know, Europe in a privileged position. Now, if indeed, as we now know, geographers, everyone who studied geography here by now should know that, you know, you can draw maps from different parts of the world. Why haven't Africa, you know, or former colonies drawn their maps, you know, from their own, you know, positionalities? It is because it's going to disrupt the order of Western knowledge. It is because there are several other things that would now no longer be true that have been made true over time by the suggestion that this is how the world appears. So it is not just the study of geography that is going to suffer. There are several other things. The rules of navigation and several other things would have to change because now we would know that the world does not look the same, you know, if it's looked at from different positionalities. But why is it that Western knowledge, Western institutions of knowledge, universities like this, why haven't they taken up a project of drawing a map of the world from the African continent? So I would be very interested, you know, to hear a counter argument from people who teach geography, for instance, in this institution, why have they not taught students how to draw the world map from here? What implications would that have for Western knowledge? But all of this, I say, in order to drive a point home, that Western knowledge goes parallel, its assumptions and, and its motivations are parallel to the motivations of colonialism. And as we've said, one of the motivations of colonialism was to leave the European at a superior position, you know, um, in relation to the African. The other point about colonialism was the fact that Europe did not just claim to provide you know, uh, or rather to have, to be possessed of a God-given mission, you know, to civilize the world. You know, um, there is a nice, you know, parallel, you know, that I often hear from people who believe in the monotheistic Christian God, you know. They say that they have a responsibility to go and preach unto those who have not heard the word of God. You know, um, they have a responsibility it is their responsibility, you know, to ensure that they extend, you know, the word of God to those who have not heard it. It's the same logic that, you know, operates within colonial knowledges. Colonial knowledges think of themselves as having a responsibility to bring this knowledge unto, you know, others. Just as you encounter those people who are possessed of that responsibility to teach us of the monotheistic God, the passion with which they are possessed of that responsibility, it's the same passion that Western knowledge carries out its project. You know, it is driven in exactly the same way as, 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 as they are driven. Now, in this, you know, civilizing mission, in this responsibility, often these people who say they have a responsibility to bring light unto us, they hold themselves up as modular examples of what it means to be godly. So Europe holds itself as an exemplar. In virtually everything you study, Europe is an exemplar. So if you study political science, we tell you that the modular examples of a democracy are found in Europe. When you study Western medicine, you know, everything, you know, Europe provides an example of it. So Europe basically becomes this modular example that is to be replicated, you know, everywhere else. So Europe provides itself or holds itself up as the example, you know, that the whole of the colonial world must look up to. You know, just as Marx said long time ago, 
he said that, you know, colonies, in looking at Britain, in fact, he was talking about British colonies. He said, British colonies, in looking at Britain, they saw their future image. Yeah. Because this is what they were going to become, or this is what they ought, you know, in history to become as they develop. So Europe, the, the notion of Europe as the example is what holds in these Western knowledges. Remember what I said at the beginning, that as you start the study of chemistry, as you start the study of you know, political science, Europe immediately comes into your subconscious. Because Europe is that example, you know, that you know, um, this knowledge holds you know, as the perfect exemplar where this knowledge, you know, has been perfected. So, you see, the traffic, again, you know, an example that comes to my mind as I'm talking now is, you only have to look at the trajectories of knowledge uh, and the pathways that Western knowledge creates. So when you study chemistry, medicine, you think that when you want to attain the best of it, when you finish at UCT, you must go to Europe or you must go to America. It's not, it's, it's automatic, it seems automatic to you that, you know, when you want to do an advanced level, you know, of study, it must be done in Europe or in America. Why doesn't it occur to you that perhaps I could do it in India? Or why doesn't it occur to you that I perhaps could study medicine and you know, specialize in medicine in Nigeria? It is because in the structure, in the very structure of these knowledges, it basically puts you, you know, in the same pathways that is the pathway of the history of this knowledge. You must go to where the source is. You know, this is where it has been perfected. This is where you find you know, the best example of this knowledge. Now, no one needs to prod you. Once you have studied for four years, you know, studying these Western knowledges, you take it as a given. You think no one should argue with you when you say that I want to go specialize in Europe. You think that everyone must understand that you've taken a logical decision. <laughs> what makes it logical? It is simply because ingrained in the Western knowledge is a certain pathway, you know. Now, what does this pathway lead to? It leads to dependence. Mm. 70 years ago, African people thought that in order to specialize, they needed to go to Europe. A hundred years later on, again, they still think that in order to specialize, they must go to Europe. This is perpetual dependence. Mm. At what point? Are you ever going to be able to master this knowledge? You cannot master it because its structure is such that it sends you back, you know, where it originated from. And so it means that Oxford will forever be Oxford. You know, as people aspire to go to Oxford today, generations after us, you know, there are people who are going to be aspiring to go there because we think that that's the logical, you know, way in which knowledge, you know, uh, advancement goes. Now, this is precisely the point about, you know, the path dependency that colonialism creates. At a political level, colonialism creates the same path dependency. Politically, we assume that, you know, if you want a model of a political democracy, you must look to Europe. At the level of knowledge, it's the same thing. So you hear politicians saying that, you know, there's a group of parliamentarians that were sent to Europe to study their model of primary and secondary education. That mentality is not of the politicians alone. This is where they work. You do the same thing once you've been trained in Western knowledge by saying that you want to go to Europe and study further. So the path dependency is both in the political realm and in the educational realm. So next time, do not criticize the politicians when they go on study tours to Europe. They are doing precisely what you are aspiring to do. It's the same logic. Because you never hear them say that they want to go and study, you know, how, 
you know, Kenya is structured, you want, they want to go and study how India is structured, no. Now, you do not only learn from things that have happened. Now, if you have autonomy of thought, you can learn from things that have not happened. You can decide to go to places where there's been failure and say that I want to understand how that failure occurred and so that I can avoid that failure, so that I can originally think my own model. Now, where is the autonomy of thought if when you are looking for a model public transport system, you must go and study the European, pick one country in Europe. I want to go study, you know, how public transport is organized in the Netherlands or in Britain or wherever, and that's the model you want to repatriate back. It is the path dependency that colonialism creates, you know, in the political realm, but also in the universities. So my point is that there is no difference between the politicians, you know, who fly to Europe and those who leave universities and go to European universities. They've both been conditioned in the same way to think that the example for everything is to be found in Europe, to hold Europe as a modular example. <clears throat> so if then Europe is this modular example that has to be replicated, this is what explains the ability, or maybe a different point first. So if Europe is this modular example, so if you want you know, to advance your knowledge in any discipline, and there's something curious here. It is not that you go to Europe you know, for advanced studies if you are studying medicine only or you are studying chemistry. For all the disciplines, for all the modern disciplines, you know, whether you are studying political science or sociology, you know, or chemistry, you must go to Europe. But sociology is a study of society. There is a society here, so why do you need to go to Europe in order to best understand a society? Why is it that you need to go to Europe in order to understand politics? Politics happens here. So the point I'm making is that it is not just one particular discipline. It is in every field that you assume that the Europe provides a modular example that is to be replicated. Now, the upshot of that is that this example is not just the example of knowledge in the classroom. This knowledge in Europe is located within a culture context. It is located within the European culture of modern, rational, you know, urbane, you know, um, forms of life. Because hardly would any of the modern disciplines make sense in rural settings. If you transform societies, rather, if you cut out the urban parts of, you know, uh, South Africa, Many of the disciplines you study would not make sense. <laughs> Rural forms of life do not completely align themselves with the modern industrial capitalist you know, organization of society. So many of the disciplines that you study only have validity in the urban setting. Now this is the culture context. You must be urbane in order for you to be able to internalize Western knowledge, which means that this Western knowledge comes with a baggage of a culture context. You must also have a certain cultural outlook in order for you to be able to make sense of this knowledge. A rural person, you know, who has not internalized the urbane way of being in the world cannot relate to many of these disciplines. So for instance, many of the precepts of, you know, psychotherapy would not make sense to rural people. Many of the things you study in clinical psychology don't make sense to people in the rural areas. For them, they look elsewhere in order to heal their spiritual or their psychological dislocation. They do not look, you know, to psychotherapy because the questions you are going to answer, ask them rather when you counsel them do not operate there. Over and above that, in that setting, as a young psychologist who's self-respecting, you know that there are questions that you can't ask an elderly person. So how would then clinical psychology function in that setting? It means that what modern disciplines do 
they give you a license to be disrespectful. <laughs> or at the least, they give you a license to disregard the norms of life that are not Western. Because in those forms of life, there are things that are not permissible. Or there are things that are impossible to do. Now, when you think that you know, these forms of you know, modern scientific knowledge are indeed objective, quickly, when you look closer, you would find you know, um, the asymmetry that I spoke of. You know, to digress a little, I'll come back to the point I'm making. Is that I encounter students who tell me that you know, as part of their post-grad project, they want to do empirical research, so they want to go to Kailicha and interview you know, people in their homes and find out, for instance, about their income levels and how they spend their money and all of that. So it means that, especially people who earn, for instance, social grants. So they want to go and interview elderly people who earn social grants and find out how they spend it, whether it's enough. So I say to them, before you do that, why don't you go to Constantia and gather a white family and ask them about their income and ask them how they spent their money. So go and gather the West Hazens in their lounge, you know, <laughs> the husband, the wife, you know, and ask them, so Mrs. West Hazen, how much do you earn? Is it possible? It's impossible. Because of the asymmetry that is ingrained in Western knowledge, you, you do not even think of it. Once you've found a study that has done that, I'll, I'll give up my profession. <laughs> <laughs> if, you have, if you find a student in the history of this university, a black student who's gone to a white suburb and interviewed a white family, just as you think that you can go to Kailicha and gather a black family and interview it. If you go do that in a white family and tell me that there is a study that has been done and written up, I'll give up you know, um, my profession. <laughs> it has never been done. It's impossible because of the asymmetry that is ingrained in Western knowledge that puts you know, the European and the white person at a superior position in relation to the black person. So it means that when we decolonize knowledge, our research methods has to change. Our research methods has to be contextual. It has to know that there are things that are not permissible within our societies. There are things that are culturally unacceptable in our society. But because our research methods are methods of the superior European coming to inquire about the black. So when you do that, you assume that you are replacing the European. You also have the same authority to gather the Daminis, you know, or whatever black family and interview them. Because that possibility is emergent from the European being the one who conducts that kind of a study. Mm. And so what you then do, you think of yourself as supplanting, you know, that European in that position, yeah. which then leads to all the problems that, you know, I've just highlighted. But I, let's return to let's return to the modular example that Europe provides. As I've said, Western knowledge makes sense only within the urban context. So it means that Western knowledge carries, you know, within a certain culture context. Now, to cut, you know, a, a more complex story short, it is that. Think of two, two academics, two itinerant academics, people who, you know, academics who love traveling, you know, and working in different parts of the world. One of these academics is white or European, and one of these academics is black. So they decide, you know, to explore the world. There is something that happens there. It is that the white European can go anywhere in the world where the university is found. Can go to Brazil, can go to you know, um, America, can go to Europe, can go to Kenya or anywhere. He or she would be acceptable because the culture context is the European urban culture context. For you, 
as an African, as an itinerant African academic, you cannot enjoy the same mobility as the white European you know, academic because you are going to soon run into certain cultural barriers. So a European who doesn't speak Portuguese, for instance, can go to Brazil and still you know, be accepted in the university there. For you, it would be impossible because you are going to be told that, you know, culturally, it would be, of course, it wouldn't be said culturally, but, you know, there will be other barriers that, you know, would limit your possibility of functioning there. Now, the point I'm driving at here is that it is easy for the European to fit in any university because the culture context of university knowledge is the European culture context. For an African, it is impossible to fit in any university anywhere because the culture context requires you first to get out of your own culture and assimilate into a different culture. For the European, it does not require the European to get out of his or her culture context. He or she, anywhere in the university, is within his or her culture context. The urban, you know, rational calculative form you know, of life. And so what it means is that what universities do forever bid us to turn away from our culture context as African people. We must leave our culture context and internalize or assimilate ourselves into a European culture context. Indeed, a successful academic, you know, or if you want to be a successful academic in these institutions, quote and unquote, all that means in practical terms is that you must try as much as possible to mimic being a European. You must speak like them, you know, you must have an accent that is closer to them, you know, you must have your examples, you know, in the classroom must be the examples that are intelligible to them, you know. Um, <coughs> but there's something else that you, you do not, you know, know or that you haven't encountered. It is that when you become an academic, for instance, in these institutions, there are certain expectations that these universities impose. It is that you must publish. Now again, here you see how Western knowledges are tied into the colonial project. So there are things that are called accredited journals that you must publish in, in order to succeed as an academic. 98% of those journals are in Europe. So it means, in Europe and in America, in North America, it means that for you as an academic to be successful in these universities, you must generate knowledge here, and then it gets published in Europe and in North America. And therefore, or automatically, it has very little circulation amongst the people from which it was generated. So how many times do you read about the academic journals that you know academics go around claiming that they've published? It is because these things are basically not meant for the consumption of the societies from which this knowledge is generated. This knowledge is then exported elsewhere, you know, where it then is part of the economy of those particular societies. Because see, these journals are part of an economy. They are damn expensive. You know, uh, universities in Africa spend millions of rand subscribing to these journals, mm -hmm. you know, from Europe. <laughs> and so these, you see that knowledge itself is tied into the circuits of colonial capital. Mm -hmm. It produces the same circulation of capital, you know, that privileges Europe, you know, to the disadvantage. And this does not matter whether it is in engineering, whether it is in medicine, it's the same logic. When you go to you know, school tomorrow, ask your lecturers in engineering, how many engineering you know, journals are published in Africa? How many of those you know, journals that are called accredited engineering journals are published within the continent? Talk less of them being published in South Africa. Most likely none. And so, in order to be a distinguished academic, you must publish in Europe, you know, and therefore, Europe, of course, must set the standard of what is acceptable as knowledge 
So when you publish in those journals, you are basically going to, you know, the European gatekeepers to say, here I am, have I met your standards? Please assess me and see whether I've met your standard. Would I be found acceptable or publishable to you? That's colonial. That's epistemic colonialism. It means that we're going to forever remain dependent on Europe, enrich Europe materially, enrich Europe with our knowledges, unless we take courageous steps, you know, to cut that, you know, unhealthy relationship that we have with you. I thank you very much.